I lived an ordinary, unremarkable life. I seemed to have everything for a comfortable existence in this world. And most importantly, I had a loving and understanding wife next to me. I thought so until recently, until I caught my wife with one of the cool lawyers. That's when my usual world collapsed. I found myself two shots deep into a bottle of Jack Daniels, facing the beginning of what promised to be a disastrously awful weekend, and it wasn't even three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. As a reporter for a small newspaper in the Midwest, I had been granted comp time off for Friday afternoon due to working late nights consecutively. With hopes of enjoying a good nap in my beloved Lazy Boy after running a few errands, I headed home. However, upon arriving, I noticed two cars parked in my driveway, one belonging to my wife of seven years, Tracy, and the other, unfamiliar. It struck me as unusual for Tracy to be home during the day, considering her usual eight to five work schedule as an actuary for a mid-sized insurance company. The presence of the second vehicle raised questions, but I remained trusting of our seemingly strong marriage. Unlocking the front door, I was greeted with a scene that shattered my world. From upstairs, unmistakable sounds of passionate intimacy emanated, indicating that my assumptions about our relationship were about to be brutally overturned. The door was ajar, revealing the unexpected guests engaged in fervent activity. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. Damn it! I ascended the carpeted stairs swiftly, taking them two steps at a time. As I approached the bedroom, their voices became distinctly audible. Is this what you desire? Is this what your inadequate husband fails to provide? exclaimed a man I didn't recognize, his words echoing through the house. Meanwhile, my wife's escalating moans indicated she was thoroughly engrossed in the moment. Upon reaching the bedroom door, I glimpsed my stunning wife lying beneath a man who resembled a linebacker for the Packers, vigorously engaged in passionate intercourse. Her legs were wrapped around his lower back as she pleaded for more. Give it to me, Derek. Don't hold back. Observing their intense connection, I couldn't help but notice the stark contrast between his size and mine. Although I've always considered myself average, he appeared to be well endowed, likely measuring nine or ten inches in length with considerable girth. It dawned on me that perhaps I wasn't satisfying her as I thought. A wave of nausea washed over me as I realized my world was unraveling before my eyes. Excuse me. Pardon the interruption, I finally exclaimed, mustering the courage to enter the room. Retrieving my gym bag from the closet, I began packing a few changes of clothes, pretending not to be affected by the scene unfolding before me. Derek didn't slow down until Tracy noticed my presence and ceased their intimate activity. Oh, damn! Simon, I'm really sorry you had to witness this, she shouted from beneath Derek. We were planning to tell you, not have you find out like this. And when exactly were you planning to do that, Trace? I retorted. On our 10th anniversary. Judging by the situation, this seems to be more than just a one-time occurrence. If you truly cared, you could have made time to tell me before all of this. Even though Derek had halted his actions with my wife, he remained inside her, and she attempted to peer around him as we conversed. Never mind, Tracy. I'll just gather a few things and leave you alone. I'll return for anything else I may need in the coming days. I'll have my lawyer prepare the necessary documents. By the way, who is this guy with you? I asked angrily. That's actually quite amusing, she chuckled. Derek is my attorney. He works for a prominent firm downtown. Perfect, I remarked sarcastically. I didn't bother closing the front door as I exited the house. I loaded my belongings into my Ford F-150 and drove straight to my favorite bar. Not exactly the most promising start to the weekend. During a quiet weekday afternoon, like many bars, the rusty fork was sparsely populated. Even my usual bartender, Noel, didn't start his shift until four. I sat in my usual spot, lost in thought. In hindsight, I should have anticipated this. At a recent work event of my wife's, her colleagues barely concealed their disdain for me. By the end of the evening, it seemed she was starting to agree with their criticisms of my job and ability to support her desired lifestyle. Tracy didn't hesitate to mention how her job paid twice as much as mine. 
We had a tensey conversation about her behavior on the way home that night, which she attributed to being somewhat tipsy. I wasn't satisfied with that excuse, but as someone who doesn't hold grudges. I thought we were fine a few days later. Or so I thought. And yet, here I am at the bar. I know I should probably be securing half of our funds in an account under my name, but right now I couldn't care less. My credit card is solely in my name, allowing me to drown my sorrows tonight before crashing in my truck. I'll figure out accommodation tomorrow. Tracy and I met at a prominent Midwestern university, dated through our junior and senior years, and eventually got engaged. We understood that unless I landed a job at a major newspaper in a big city, she would likely out-earn me. However, we both agreed that our earnings were joint, not divided. That's what I believed until recently. I'm unsure how much of her change in attitude is influenced by her colleagues, but it's apparent that she's lost all respect for me, and as for her love, well, today made it painfully clear where I stand. Noel welcomed me at four o'clock and was mildly surprised by my early arrival. I briefly recounted my afternoon and handed him my pickup keys, instructing him to assist me into the vehicle's cab when I was ready, but not to return the keys until I woke up the next day. That's tough, man, finding out like that, he remarked during our conversation. Around 9 p.m. I was completely numb, including my limbs, when a state trooper entered the bar. He casually approached Noel behind the bar and inquired about a Mr. Simon Tillerson on the premises. Noel naturally gestured towards me. The trooper then made his way over to me. He seemed quite adept at this casual stroll, I noted through my hazy mind, and regretfully informed me of some news. My wife and a Mr. Derek Biggs had been killed in a car accident approximately three hours earlier, when a semi-truck ran a red light in town and collided with Mr. Biggs's BMW convertible. Authorities had been trying to locate me for three hours before one of my acquaintances directed them to my favorite bar. Damn, I exclaimed, drinks are on me, there's a higher power up there. A cheer erupted in response to my declaration. Trooper Reginald Masters appeared shocked, as if he'd just seen a ghost. He seemed unprepared for the joy emanating from the newly widowed man. Mr. Tillerson, I understand you must be in a state of shock, but... Not shock, buddy, ecstasy, I exclaimed in my intoxicated state. The reason I'm so messed up is because I caught the two of them in bed together this afternoon. I was planning to leave that woman to hell with her. This situation couldn't be any better. The trooper still wore a look of disgust, but I couldn't have cared less. Usually we prefer for the next of kin to confirm the identity of the deceased, just to be absolutely certain. But I don't believe Mr. Tillerson will be of any assistance tonight, Masters said to Noel. Could you ensure that someone reminds him to come to the morgue tomorrow? Noel nodded in agreement. Despite being heavily intoxicated, I comprehended what Masters had told me. And even though I knew I would miss my wife once I sobered up, she had betrayed me and was planning to replace me. So at that moment, my anger towards Tracy outweighed any remaining love I had for her. The next morning, I awoke feeling stiff and achy in the cab of my pickup truck. I probably looked terrible as well, but I made my way back into the bar to retrieve my keys and drive to a hotel. However, I remembered what the trooper had said the previous night. So instead I drove back to my empty house pondering Tracy and the nine years we had spent together, seven of them as husband and wife. I felt more melancholic than anything else about how things had ended between us. I couldn't say I was truly grieving because, even though I was no longer drunk, I still felt a sense of satisfaction that she and her lover got what I believed they deserved. I returned home, took a quick shower, freshened up, and then made my way to the morgue to identify the body. Tracy's appearance was shocking. It seemed evident that being hit by a semi-truck while in a convertible had taken its toll. I requested to also see the other body, Derek, who bore a resemblance to Tracy. I hoped that in his case death had been less abrupt. Upon returning home I knew I had to make three phone calls, one to my parents, one to Tracy's parents, and one to her sister, Anya. Deep down I felt a twinge of regret at her passing but every memory of her was overshadowed by the image of her with her lover. 
and I struggled to conjure up any genuine sorrow. So, I resolved to focus on my duty, to relay the facts and keep my emotions at bay as much as possible. However, I couldn't help but feel sympathy for Ron and Cindy Jacobs, Tracy's parents, who were now grieving the loss of their daughter. I cared for Ron and Cindy deeply, almost as much as my own parents, and I dreaded seeing them in pain. In that regard, this situation was going to be immensely challenging. I phoned my parents first to share the news. My mom, who is usually more emotional, immediately burst into tears. My dad, on the other end of the line, began asking for more details. I explained that Tracy was in the car with Derek Biggs during the accident. Who's Derek Biggs? He asked directly. I anticipated the question, but still hesitated before answering, which probably spoke a volumous to him. He's an attorney friend of Tracy's, I replied. My father is very intelligent and perceptive. He didn't miss a beat. Why was she with her attorney friend instead of being home with you? He asked. Because she wasn't with me anymore, Dad. I caught her and Derek having sex in our bed earlier that day, and I suspect it wasn't their first time, so I packed a bag and left. I don't know why they were in the car around 6 o'clock. I assume they were going out to eat given the time. Well, that's unfortunate, son. I'm sorry to hear that, my dad responded. By this point, my mother had regained her composure and joined the conversation again. She had heard enough to understand the situation. Are you absolutely certain she was cheating on you, Simon? You don't want to spread rumors if you're not completely sure. I interjected without much tact. Mom, I stumbled upon them in the act. I've had a few experiences myself over the years, so I know exactly what I saw. Have you spoken to Ron and Cindy yet, Simon? If not, what do you plan to say to them? My father inquired. As little as possible, Dad, unless they start interrogating me like you're doing. I won't fabricate anything if that's what you're asking. Then things could escalate, son. Remember, they're your in-laws. Treat them with the respect they're due. Yes, sir, I replied solemnly. The conversation with Tracy's parents unfolded eerily similarly to the one I had with my own. While her mother was distraught, my father-in-law immediately picked up on the fact that she was with another man in the car at the time of her death, when she should have been with me at that time of day. Is there something you're hiding, Simon? Ron's voice came through as Cindy sobbed in the background. At six on a Friday evening, Tracy should have been with her husband, yet she was in a car with another man. This doesn't make sense, son. Okay, okay, I half shouted, half croaked into the phone. Tracy was cheating on me. I caught her in bed hours earlier with the guy she died with, and I packed some things and left. I suppose they realized at that point they had nothing left to conceal and decided to go out together. You caught them together. In bed. In your own home. Ron sounded incredulous. It was hard for him to believe that the daughter he had just been informed was dead had also been unfaithful to her husband and died in the car with her lover. Yes, Ron, yes. And right now, I'm so furious with her that I'm almost relieved. They're both dead. The deceitful woman and her lover got what was coming to them. I knew I shouldn't have said that last sentence to her father anyway. He started yelling at me on the phone until I intervened quietly but decisively. He made fun of me, Ron, when he was doing it with your daughter, and she agreed with it. Yes, your daughter, and my wife. I think it saves me from having to divorce her. She won't be buried in my family's plot, and I certainly won't want to be near her when my time comes. So just tell me the name of the funeral home your family uses, and I'll make sure the body gets there. I will take care of all this part and the financial side. You and Cindy will take care of everything else, like watching. Obviously, I won't be there. Son, you can't just ignore the significance she had in your life, Ron said soothingly. You spent nearly a decade together. You can't convince me that all those memories can simply vanish. It's possible, Dad, I replied. Our relationship ended the moment I caught her with Derek Biggs in our bedroom. Why should her death alter how I feel? 
Perhaps in time you'll see things differently and regret not bidding her a proper farewell, Ron said almost in a whisper. I doubt it, I murmured. The funeral took place at Ron and Cindy's local church, the same church where Tracy and I exchanged vows to love, honor, and cherish each other before God and our families. The irony wasn't lost on me. I entertained the idea of attending for about ten seconds before anger overwhelmed me. Have you ever wanted to strangle a dead person? That's where I was. Attending the funeral might have eased Tracy's parents' pain, but it would have only fueled my anger. And believe me, I had more than enough to go around. About an hour after I anticipated the service would end, I received a call from Tracy's sister, Anya. I knew this wouldn't be pleasant, but perhaps she needed to vent, especially if her parents hadn't told her the whole story. Tracy's assessment was accurate. You're insignificant, your aspirations are meager, and so is your anatomy. You pen mundane articles for a local publication with no promising future ahead. It's a wonder it took her so long to seek solace elsewhere. Well, good day to you as well, Anya, I greeted, unfazed. So you were aware all along. Then why entertain the idea of my presence if I'm so reprehensible? Because you brought shame upon my family, you contemptible person. How do you justify why Tracy's husband was absent from the funeral? My parents were mortified explaining to the Reverend why you weren't there. You're despicable, and I wish ill upon you. Finally grasping it, Anya, I retorted over the phone. That's precisely how I felt about your sister and her paramour after catching them. And you know what? Fortune favored me. They met their demise. So why don't you just go away and leave me be? I considered that exchange a success. I enlisted a realtor and promptly listed the house for sale. I relocated my belongings to the spare room and sold off all our bedroom furnishings at a bargain, including the bedding. I had no intention of touching any of it again. As for Tracy's possessions, I took her jewelry, most of which I had given her, and sold it to a local jeweler, donating the proceeds to a church food pantry. Her clothes and other items I packed up and delivered to her parents, informing them they could do as they pleased with it. Among those boxes was our wedding album and the usual array of small photographs. I had enough memories of Tracy etched in my mind, including the final one of her and Derek Biggs in our marital bed, a sight I'd never forget. Ron and I exchanged pleasantries as he assisted with unloading my pickup truck. After the final box was unloaded, I exchanged glances with Ron and Cindy before we embraced tightly as a family. Tears were streaming down our faces, I'm pretty sure we were all crying. See you guys, I managed to whisper as my voice broke. All of this took place within the first two weeks following Tracy's passing. Amidst the chaos, I received a call from Cruz Miller Insurance. Tracy and I had always maintained life insurance, so I understood the reason for their call. However, it hadn't been a priority for me until I had sorted out everything else. With the more pressing matters resolved, it was time to return their call. Tracy, being the expert in insurance matters, had handled all our insurance arrangements. While we discussed everything, I trusted her judgment in her field. One of her decisions was to secure a $1 million life policy for each of us, with a double indemnity clause for accidental death before the age of 45. This meant a $2 million payout was forthcoming. But then the insurance agent mentioned something that nearly made me choke on my coffee. It appeared that since the truck driver was at fault for the accident, his company would be liable for some form of compensation for wrongful death, unless I opted to pursue legal action for maximum compensation. They would compensate for both Tracy and Derek. She advised me not to settle for less than an additional $2 million, suggesting that $3 million to $4 million would be appropriate given the circumstances. After attorney fees, I could expect to have around $5 million in my account. After the Lao Year took his share, he ended up with $475 million in my bank account. At that point, I was so numb that he didn't really carry. The trucking company also settled with Derek Biggs' widow, and the signing for both settlements was scheduled to happen at the same time and place. I hadn't met Derek's widow until the signing, and although I thought Tracy was attractive, Derek's widow was equally stunning. 
It made me wonder why he would risk his marriage for an affair. Perhaps he was so confident he wouldn't get caught that he didn't consider the consequences. After signing the paperwork, Ellie Biggs asked me out for coffee. She had one burning question that no one else seemed able to answer, and she hoped I could provide some clarity. My husband didn't have a friend named Tracy Tillerson that I knew of, and his firm confirmed she wasn't a client. Yet they were together in the car when they died. No one in Derek's office knows who she is, or if they do, they won't tell me. What was your wife to my husband, Mr. Tillerson? I took a deep breath. I hated being the bearer of bad news, especially to such a beautiful woman. As we sat in Starbucks, she waited for my response. It's not good news, she said, anticipating my answer. But please, Mr. Tillerson, I deserve to know the truth. So I recounted the entire story from my perspective. She looked horrified. Suddenly, I felt sick to my stomach. Thank you for being honest, she said, rising from the table and leaving the coffee shop. Despite now being wealthy by most standards, my life felt empty. I had no interest in dating, settled into a dingy one-bedroom apartment just for shelter, and had few friends whom I didn't really care about. I worked at the newspaper, spent a lot of time biking, and lifted weights several times a week. I was just going through the motions. My father, God rest his soul, eventually persuaded me to see a therapist. The diagnosis? Trust issues. He urged me to engage more with the outside world and attempt to lead a semblance of a normal life. That session felt like a waste of time. I never scheduled another appointment. So there I was, at home, watching baseball, lost in thought, replaying a conversation with Anya that took place after Tracy's funeral six months earlier. She remarked that I wrote short stories for a local newspaper, and she was correct. I had taken the job solely because it was close to where Tracy worked. Since she earned more than me, I sacrificed my ambition of moving to a bigger paper until Tracy suggested relocating, at which point I planned to reassess. But now, I wasn't bound to the community anymore. In fact, I didn't need to work another day in my life. I was free to come and go as I pleased, to write whatever I pleased, and I didn't care if anyone ever read it. The next day, I handed in my resignation to my boss, Ernie, giving two weeks' notice. That night, as I sat in my apartment, I glanced at my modest book collection, about 30 books, predominantly non-fiction. One of the two fiction books was Moby Dick by Herman Melville. That sparked a thought which some would say is perilous for me. One of my academic strengths, according to various tests, was abstract thinking. Before the age of hyperlinks on the internet, I engaged in it frequently in my mind. I would take a notion, contemplate it, subtly twist it and explore a different direction. It suited me, but it often left my friends struggling to follow my thought process during deep discussions. They learned never to inquire what if in my presence. Ten minutes later, it struck me that Tracy was akin to my white whale, and I needed to pursue her. But I would do it through the medium of the written word. And thus, it began. I sat down at the computer and crafted my first work of fiction since eighth grade. The character Derek Biggs met his demise, and the character Tracy faced severe trials in life. It took me two full days to write, edit, and refine it. But for the first time in six months, I felt invigorated. I couldn't exact revenge on Tracy in reality, but through this story, I could in my imagination. Over the next two months, I continued to craft 17 additional short stories, varying elements but maintaining a couple of consistent themes, the recurring demise of the character Derek and the inevitable comeuppance of Tracy. It was immensely satisfying to complete each story, set it aside, and then read the final product. Then I stumbled upon Moby Dick, a tangible book with a cover and bound pages. I can achieve that, I quietly affirmed to myself, and indeed I did. Six months later, I birthed my inaugural novel, an unexpected historical romance. Naturally, Derek met his end in a rather brutal fashion, while Tracy once again faced humility. I found it rather satisfactory, and apparently so did a publisher. The deal wasn't stellar, but at least I wasn't footing the bill for self-publishing. I'm uncertain how it all fell into place, but someone other than myself found merit in the book, 
prompting the publishing company to undertake two more print runs. They requested a sequel, doubling the monetary offer, so I obliged. This time, it was a murder mystery where Derek met his demise and Tracy landed behind bars. With each completed book, I found solace, bolstered by robust sales that mirrored a collective agreement with my sentiments regarding Tracy and Derek. Following the success of the second book, another publishing company pursued me, extending a three-book deal with double the compensation. Given my existing wealth, though undisclosed, I didn't require the money. Thus, I granted the initial company the opportunity to match the offer, which they promptly did. I remained loyal to them, delivering three more books over the ensuing 18 months. While the overarching storyline remained constant, I introduced varying scenarios, even dabbling in humor in the third installment. Each book resonated with readers, but most importantly, I found a deepening sense of self-assurance with every completed manuscript. It was my closest semblance to satisfaction, acknowledging that answers to my lingering questions about her actions would likely never materialize. As the old adage goes, love the one you're with. I recently inked another three-book deal with my publisher, this time with my fee doubling once more. Interestingly, there was even bigger news this time around. Apparently, a movie studio expressed interest in adapting at least two of my books into feature films, offering quite a generous sum. They also requested my involvement in writing the screenplay. Figured, why not? I agreed. While I hadn't been particularly fond of Oprah Winfrey, her endorsement could catapult an author to success. When she selected my sixth book as one of her monthly picks, I got to experience that firsthand. It was exhilarating. Not only did it elevate me to a successful author status, but it also brought recognition in public. Naturally, there were drawbacks to newfound fame, dealing with occasional jerks trying to show their indifference towards me. That's fine. I'm not overly impressed with myself either, but I won't tolerate disrespect from others. I can dish out rudeness as well as anyone. So there I was at my favorite bar, the same one where the state trooper broke the news about Tracy's demise simply relishing a Friday evening with my old friend Jack Daniels. Despite now being worth over $10 million, I still cherished life's simpler pleasures. A good drink, staying fit, biking, and occasional liaisons with attractive women. I continued living in my rundown apartment, not actively seeking lasting romantic connections. Some of the regulars at the bar probably knew about my writing success, but they mostly left me alone, engaging in light banter now and then. I suspected half of them couldn't even read, which ruled them out as potential fans. Noel, my favorite bartender, was privy to my achievements and we occasionally discussed my work or ongoing projects. He was a stand-up guy who evidently kept my affairs private. Perhaps the fact that I generously tipped him $20 every visit played a role in his discretion. I was engrossed in the television, absorbed in the background music and generally detached from life, when two women suddenly appeared beside me at the bar. Both were attractive, probably in their mid-thirties like myself, dressed casually in jeans and regular tops, not seeking to impress anyone. Yet there was something familiar about the one furthest from me, a recognition that dawned on me as soon as she initiated conversation. Do you remember me, Mr. Tillerson? she asked while her friend leaned back on her stool, granting us a clear line of sight. Initially, I didn't recall, but then it struck me. I was face to face with Ellie Biggs, the widow of Derek Biggs. We had only met once during the settlement signing when the trucking company compensated us for the infidelities of our spouses. It was then I confirmed for her that yes, her husband was indeed cheating with my wife. I certainly do remember you, Mrs. Biggs. I replied. It took me a moment, however. How have you been? You look wonderful, if I may say so. Ellie blushed, exchanging a glance with her friend before meeting my gaze. I'm much better than the last time you saw me, and honestly, I have you to thank for that, at least emotionally, she confessed. Derek's death left me considerably richer, but emotionally shattered. Discovering his infidelity compounded the pain. I was both sad and furious, especially that I never got the chance to confront him about it. Then one day Rachel here handed me your first book, 
She recognized your name on the cover from our previous encounter. Initially, I skimmed through it, realizing you were writing about our worthless spouses. And yet, you drew me in. The moment Derek's character met his end, I felt an overwhelming sense of relief. And when Tracy got her comeuppance, I felt vindicated, for lack of a better word. It was the first time I'd felt remotely at peace since that dreadful day. Since then, I've devoured every book you've written. It might sound silly, but they've helped me reclaim a sense of self-worth. And I can't help but chuckle like a schoolgirl every time Derek and Tracy get what's coming to them. I feel the same way when I finish writing a piece, I remarked. I'm glad I could be of assistance to you, too. Judging by how well they've sold, it seems like there are many others who can empathize with our experiences. Honestly, I never thought about pursuing writing as a career. I hadn't written fiction since middle school. Perhaps having my settlement money and insurance funds relieved the pressure, allowing the words to flow more easily. I'll continue as long as it brings me joy. The three of us relocated to a table, and I purchased a couple of snack trays for us to nibble on. We chatted until midnight, when the ladies said they had to leave. I told them it had been a long time since I'd enjoyed such a pleasant evening, and asked if we could do it again sometime. How about next Friday night? But we start with a proper dinner. On me, I suggested. They both agreed. The following Friday night I met them at my favorite Italian restaurant once again, and we had another enjoyable time. Both women were attractive. Ellie had long blonde hair, blue eyes, and a curvy figure, while Rachel sported long black hair and a more athletic build, reminiscent of a volleyball player with long toned legs, a firm buttocks, and perhaps a B-cup chest. Ellie wore a blouse with a lower neckline that accentuated her C-cup breasts, whereas Rachel opted for a short form-fitting skirt that highlighted her best features. Frankly, I felt a bit awkward having the two most attractive women seated at my table. Actually, that's a lie. I absolutely reveled in having them there. We savored a delicious meal and engaging conversation as I got to know them better. However, since the restaurant was crowded with a waiting list, I suggested we vacate the table and grab drinks at a nearby club about ten minutes away. Rachel declined the invitation, so I agreed to drive Ellie home after our drinks. At Stella's bar, Ellie and I found ourselves in a half-filled space making conversation effortless. My first question to her was whether she or Rachel had won. Had the winner secured my attention or had the loser? It seemed Ellie underestimated my understanding of the female psyche, as she blushed deeply. I, I was the winner, I hope, she stammered. Actually, I believe I'm the winner here, but truth be told, I felt like a winner the moment both of you joined me. I reckon every guy in the restaurant wanted to throttle me for monopolizing the company of the two most beautiful women, I remarked. Ellie blushed once more. Can I confide in you about something on the condition that you won't get angry? She asked, looking at me with earnestness, scrunching up her nose. I nodded cautiously, uncertain of the direction the conversation was taking. When I left the lawyer's office after signing the settlement papers, I despised you. Even though I knew you weren't involved in Derek's affair with Tracy, the fact that you were aware of it while I wasn't made me feel inferior. Given the circumstances, I didn't handle it well. It felt like you were keeping something from me. I sensed that, and I completely understood. Besides, the idea of us getting together after our cheating partners met their demise... That's just absurd. Those things only happen on the Hallmark Channel, so I let you leave without a goodbye. A year later, Rachel handed me this book, Ellie continued, and it was evident that you had poured your heart into its pages. It was clear it revolved around the affair between our spouses. Reading it was like a revelation. You understood everything. I'd been in therapy for almost a year, and my therapist noticed a change in me immediately after reading the book. So I gave it to him, and at our next session, he said, and I quote, Pardon my French, but this guy's a fucking genius. Well, if I'm such a fucking genius, then why am I living modestly with over $10 million in the bank? Ellie looked surprised. I knew about your settlement and the insurance money, but I didn't realize you were so well off. Why are you living like that? 
Because when you're alone and hesitant to trust anyone, money loses its significance, I replied. I'm essentially a simple man with no major indulgences. I don't have to work, if you consider my writing as work. I have no one to share my life or my wealth or with. As I vocalized it for the first time, I recognized how pitiful my situation was. I was essentially living in a fantasy world where I exacted revenge on Tracy and Derek every few months. Sure, it was enjoyable, but in reality I wasn't truly living. I was merely existing. I sat at the table for an unknown duration, lost in emptiness, oblivious to sound or sensation, until a sudden jolt electrified my lips. It wasn't my lips, but Ellie's pressed against mine, her tongue soon intertwining with mine. I responded eagerly, like a parched man finding water in the desert. Our kiss lasted perhaps thirty seconds before she broke away, instructing me to settle the bill and take her to my apartment. I complied, as if emerging from a trance. Since Tracy's passing over four years ago, I've engaged in physical encounters with several women, but hadn't truly made love since losing my wife. Ellie and I both understood this having discussed our respective pasts, so I approached our intimacy with care and tenderness. Our kisses were profound, our exploration deliberate and sensitive. It was as if we were sculpting sensations with our fingertips, evoking a sense of admiration akin to that of Stevie Wonder. When we reached the climax, I ensured ample lubrication before slowly uniting with her. Our lovemaking unfolded almost in slow motion, each movement laden with sensation. I felt every contour of her body, especially as she tightened around me. It was a transcendent experience, culminating in a shared release of passion that engulfed us both. I momentarily lost all perception of time and space, and when I came to I found myself gently positioned atop Ellie, propped up mostly by my trembling arms. With effort, I shifted us to our sides facing each other as she gradually opened her eyes, still catching her breath. Wow, she mouthed silently to me. We lay there silently, exchanging playful glances like teenagers. Finally, she spoke. I understand everything you've told me, and all I can say is, if you let me in and trust me, I'll prove myself worthy of your trust every day for the rest of our lives. If that's a proposal... I accept. No, we didn't rush into marriage after one incredible night together, but it marked the beginning of our life journey together. About a year later, once we both felt we had resolved our personal issues, we tied the knot. We moved into a spacious new house in the countryside with five bedrooms, one for us and one for each of the four children we hoped to have. We even added a guest suite anticipating frequent visitors, and I discovered a newfound ability to write about subjects beyond the Tracy and Derek revenge stories. Once Ellie entered my life, I found less need to fictionalize our past, but I still churned out one or two stories a year for the joy of it and to the delight of my publisher's accountants. The karma train had been kind to me, and I was happy to bring a few more passengers along for the journey.